there was an economics release, jobs opening, jobs report, that uh, just came out on Tuesday. And the jobs report was was underwhelming. Uh, a lot of uh, financial analysts and political talking heads thought there was going to be a million jobs added. By the time it was revised and all kinds of shenanigans that goes on with the jobs report, there was only 260,000 jobs added, which I'm not a political hack who's going to say that that's Biden's fault or Trump's fault or whatnot. Because I think the president has a little bit less to do with the economy than we all want to believe that he does. But at the end of the day, what I thought was actually more interesting than the jobs reports, did we add a million jobs or 233,000 jobs or did we lose 100,000 jobs or whatever the case may be, what I thought was more interesting was the number of job openings, right? And it's, it's at the very top of the report here. And uh, for those of you that are maybe following along or watching this, I always try to go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics because I think one of the biggest problems with America right now is that even though you, thank you Google, can go to the source material of basically anything you wanna have an opinion on, what most people go to is the editorial of a commentator of a report that was an editorial on the actual publication, right? I don't wanna read somebody else's opinion of an opinion of an opinion of a report if I can just go directly to the report, right? When somebody's commenting on the Georgia voters law, I don't wanna get the talking points from Ben Shapiro on the right or Rachel Maddow on the left. I just wanna go to the bill. Actually, let's, well, we'll look that up later. Well, you can just go to the bill and read it yourself. I think the Georgia voter bill, which you know Democrats are, are comparing to Jim Crow laws, not accurate. Um, and Republicans are comparing to just kind of normal course of business, not accurate. Obviously, they're bitter that they lost uh, in Georgia, which uh, which was a big deal in the election. Uh, but you can just, it doesn't matter. You can just go to the bill and read it yourself. So I always try to go to a government website to look at the actual press release or the actual numbers. There are a couple other sites I'm going to show you here as we scroll through that I trust. But guys, if you're hearing something about, for example, when Trump incited the riot, Right, or he didn't incite the riot, depending on what talking head you're talking, you're you're listening to. Don't again, don't listen to Ben Shapiro's opinion or Rachel Maddow's opinion, because you're just going to hear information that comes from that echo chamber. Go on YouTube and watch the whole 12 minute clip of the speech and you make your own opinion, right? I'm always shocked how many people have these extremely strong opinions of things and they haven't viewed the source material. As a matter of fact, somewhere behind me here, um, I think I've got the book. I'm listening to it in audio. I'm listening to it on audiobook, but I, I also think I bought the hardcover of How to Be a Anti Racist by Ibram Kendi. And uh, not a book I was particularly interested in, but so many of the talking points right now from progressives are coming from that book. I'm like, well, instead of reading somebody's opinion of that book or editorialized um, review of that book, why don't I just go read the book, right? Go to the source material. We probably all learned that in junior college history 101 uh, to read some of the source material, right? Read the Federalist Papers, read letters back and forth between people that ended up becoming our presidents. Anyway, I digress. So going here to this uh, jobs opening and labor turnover, the jobs opening is the most interesting thing to me is basically in 2020, depending on what statistics you look at, and again, I try to go to the Bureau of Labor, the U.S. lost about 20 million jobs in 2020. And they register that by people that left their job in a manner where they were eligible for unemployment. So that 20 million jobs does not tell the whole story of people who were underemployed or were maybe laid off but weren't working in a job where they were eligible for unemployment. Then again, last year for the first time, I think ever, unemployment was available to people who were self-employed. So if you were like a realtor, but you couldn't drum up any business because there was no open houses, because the market was shut down due to COVID, you could go on unemployment. So that 20 million number is probably actually more accurate than we think it is. But I digress. About 20 million jobs were lost last year. Between, depending on whether or not you're Florida and you reopened over the summer or you're California and you might completely reopen one day in 2024, depending on when the states decided to reopen, we've gained back about 12 million of those jobs. But right here, this is a really dangerous number in my opinion. The number of job, op uh, job openings edged up to 7.4 million jobs. So we lost 20 million, about <coughs> excuse me, about 12 million have been rehired over the last 60 days to six months. But 7.4 million jobs 
are still currently on the market. There's there's job openings that cannot be filled. And Chris, maybe you could Google real quick what the current uh, unemployment rate is. Uh, and the unemployment rate is usually expressed as a uh, percentage number, but you can also get like the raw numbers. Like unemployment currently is 6.7%, which means there's 10 million, dollar, 10 million people seeking jobs. Maybe you can look that up real quick. Uh, and, and, and here's where I can't stand the government. It says 9%. 9%. Okay. Uh, see if you can find out what that number is. Does 9% represent like 10 million people looking for a job or does it represent 100,000 people looking for a job? You can interrupt me whenever you get to it. But, you know, here is the thing about we're here from the government. We're here to help. Fa famous last words. Fa famous last thing you want to hear. One of the byproducts of having an aggressive, aggressive social safety net and all the bailout money and the stimulus money is people respond to incentives, right? People respond to incentives. That's just how the human brain works. That's how society works. And if your social safety net programs become so aggressive that you're paying people more to stay at home and not work than return to work, well, this is exactly what you're gonna have. You're gonna have 7.5 million people that that could be filling jobs there's seven or 7.4 million jobs that need to be filled there's jobs openings on the market and they can't get people to fill it so it says there's a total of 1.6 million people unemployed with a total number of jobs available at 15.8 million yeah Okay, so there's a lot more jobs available than there are people unemployed. Think about that. Unemployment at 9%. No, no, no. There's there's 15.8 million payroll people working right now in California. Okay. And then they say one point, whatever I said, 1.68 million are looking for work. Got it. Got it. Okay, cool. So on the national level, that's the state level. On the national level, we've probably got then somewhere around 10 to 20 million people 10 to 15 million people unemployed. See if you can find that, the national number of unemployed people. I, I would guess it's somewhere around 10 million, 10 to 15 million, I would guess, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, the point is, there's a lot of jobs out there, right? But depending on which study you read, and again, who's parsing out the numbers, when you look at unemployment uh, compensation, then you look at it's wavered between $100 and $300 a week, additional unemployment benefits coming out of the bailout money. And then you look at the stimulus checks and then you look at the ability to sign up for food stamps and housing assistance, you know, depending on how many programs people take advantage of, it's been estimated that in 2020, because of the increased benefit on unemployment and the stimulus checks, staying at home and doing nothing is paying somewhere between 17 and $22 an hour to do nothing. And if you look at minimum wage jobs in America or you look at entry level jobs, especially in the hospitality business and the food service business, it's not uncommon to have those entry level jobs pay 10 to 12 to $13. So just knowing that human beings respond to incentives, why would you go back to a $12 an hour job if the government is paying you $18 to stay home? Now, I'm not saying there shouldn't be a social safety net at some level. There absolutely should for the, the most downtrodden, the people that are in the most need. However, having millions of able body Americans staying out of work and not filling these jobs because they're getting paid more to stay at home is the moral hazard that's created by the government having such an aggressive social safety net. Uh, there's a... 9.8 million people nationally unemployed at a rate of 6.1%. Uh, okay, so so nationally, there's about 10 million people unemployed, and there's 7.4 million jobs out there. So we could take the unemployment rate down to 2 or 3%, which would be the probably the lowest of all time, if we could just fill these job openings, which can't be filled right now because the government is paying too many people to stay home. Ugh, frustrating. Don't you think it has something to do with the fact that, I mean, this kind of proves that the government has no idea what people are actually making? <laughs> yeah, no, they, they, have no, they have no clue. And, you know, uh, Chris and I had talked about it, about some friends that we have, where the stimulus checks weren't even means tested. Meaning, let's say, for example, one, they were, they, I take that back, I'm sorry, the government stimulus checks were means tested. You had to make under X amount of dollars uh, in order to get the stimulus check. But, you didn't have to opt into it. So let's take, for example, a couple of examples that I know. Um, married couple, 
retired, earning Social Security and a pension for some government job, call it teacher, police, sheriffs, whatever. They're making $60,000 a year between them, but their house is paid off. They have money in savings. They really have no debt or overhead. They're very comfortable on their retirement wages of Social Security plus their pension. All of those people, if they made, I think it was under $74,000, maybe you can fact check me on this as well, Chris. Um, I think if you made under $74,000, you just got the $1,400 stimulus check and then you got the other $1,400 stimulus check. And so what we what we could have done just to save hundreds of millions of dollars is had people opt in for that. Because I know a lot of people that got the check that didn't need it. For example, my son, he's 19. He's, uh, he's working at a Whole Foods type uh, grocery store out in Long Island while he's going to college. I'm happy to pay his bills for him. He comes from a upper middle class family where people can financially support him. When he went to go file his taxes for last year, because he made, I don't know, $10,000 working at the grocery store, his tax person said, hey, oh, hey, you weren't in the system because last year was his first job. So you were owed this stimulus check because you made under X amount of dollars. We're going to add it to your tax refund and send you the three stimulus checks you should have got last year because you were working and you made under $74,000. And now he's getting he can't even opt out of it. He's getting something like $3,600 back in additional tax refund that he doesn't need. The government didn't need to spend that money. I, If he really needed that money, I would give it to him or he would just work more hours or he would limit his expenses. So there's just so much, so many unintended consequences, so much government waste just being pumped out in free money that the government just, at this point, they just don't even know what they're doing, right? And so the next argument that you'll frequently hear from progressives is like, well, this is just a telltale sign that people aren't making a fair um, living wage and everybody's on minimum wage. And why would you go back to some shitty job flipping burgers when you can stay home for a year or 18 months and make 18 bucks an hour living off the government and unemployment? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, because you should. Uh, two, there's a moral hazard of creating people that get comfortable living off the government. And three, I can tell you from experience, sorry, I relight the cigar. I can tell you from experience, from friends and family that I have and people that I have interviewed, and I've interviewed a lot of people over the years for jobs, assistance, marketing, uh, the mortgage business, the coaching business, the podcast. I'm, I've interviewed a lot of people. Uh, I've sat on a lot of interview boards. I've interviewed a lot of entry-level people. And the reality is once you leave the job force for about a year, your ability to enter the job force at the same pay rate at which you left goes down dramatically because whether it's conscious or subconscious, business owners are scared to hire people that don't have a recent track record of hard work, right? In the course of a year, technology changes. Things just kind of move forward. You guys all know how quickly technology changed. You know, five years ago, nobody was really listening to a podcast. You know, a, a year ago, you were probably using a different CRM or point of sale system or operating system at your work or things get upgraded, things change. The environments get more fast paced, right? Businesses evolve. And so if you take yourself out of the job force, and I don't care if you're flipping burgers or making lattes for minimum wage, when you take yourself out of the job force for a year, um, your chances of re-entering the market go down dramatically at the same spot that you left as far as compensation. I've got a really good friend. Um, he's a legitimate genius, like Mensa genius, uh, degree in statistics and actuarial sciences, like one of the sharpest guys I know, but he took like 10 years off to go play professional poker. And this guy, when I, when I say he's a genius, he's a legit genius. Like he could be a day trading hedge fund manager. He could be an analyst at a big financial firm. Like he's got that, that money brain, but because he took himself out of the job market for 10 years, he's now in his mid thirties, like on his resume, not really qualified uh, for anything. He's like, if, if I walk in my, with my resume, I'm looking for a minimum wage job. Now, granted, that's a totally different kind of anecdotal story, but there's just, there's this proof that we have that once you take yourself out of the job market at $10 an hour, $12 an hour, $100,000 a year, it's really hard to re-enter the job market at that same price point. And when, when I hear people mostly progressive say, well, this is just, this is just symptomatic of the fact that like we don't pay, pay our people, we don't pay people a fair living wage and too many people are making minimum wage. Again, I want to go to the numbers, right? And uh, this is one website that I will use. It's called USA Facts. 
they're a nonpartisan, non like party affiliated think tank. You know, a lot of think tanks, the Cato Institute, the Hoover Institute, uh, the Rand Institute, you know, when, when you pay to have them generate a report or a survey, you they kind of know what you're paying for. They want you to have a certain um, slant on the data. Uh, USA Facts, I've been a big fan of. I feel like their data is just laid out very succinctly. Uh, so I went to USA Facts to get kind of the consolidated facts on minimum wage. And I, I think this is really, really important to understand when, when mostly the Democrats or progressives paint this picture of the millions of people that are living in poverty because they only make minimum wage. And why would you want to go back to a minimum wage? You know, I wanted to look up the data on who actually makes the minimum wage. So first of all, the minimum wage in America, I think, is $7.50 an hour. Uh, yeah, $7.50 an hour. Um, that or seven seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour, seven twenty five an hour. Uh, however, most states, most states, and you can see here, have higher minimum wages. California's thirteen dollars, Nevada's eight dollars, Oregon's twelve dollars. Most states in America have a higher minimum wage than the federal minimum wage. Uh, the highest is uh, Georgia and Wyoming. Uh, per, uh, no, the highest is Wyoming at fifteen dollars an hour. Same in Washington D.C. We could talk about, I don't want to talk about the state minimum wage, let's just talk about the federal minimum wage of seven twenty five. And if you go down, you can look at, well, how many people actually earn the minimum wage, right? And for that, I wanted to go directly to the, here we go, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Again, let's go straight to the government sources who collects this number, these numbers. And the most accurate numbers are going to be from 2019 because it takes quite a while to like compile this data. But let's look at the percentage of Americans that make minimum wage. And the first thing you have to do when you look at this data is minimum wage is only calculated, well, yeah, it's effectively calculated for people that are working hourly. So I found this stat here, minimum wage, it's about 51% of Americans, 56% of Americans are paid on a hourly rate. So... Uh, I'll find the data. Just trust me on this one. It was around 51% of people are paid on an hourly rate. That means the other 49% of people that are working that are part of the labor force, they're paid either a salary or they're self-employed and who knows what they're doing with their own wa with their wages. But at the end of the day, uh, yeah, young, young workers get a lot more minimum wage. I really want to see this so that you could occupation. All right, it must be over here. We'll find it. Uh, maybe it's in table one. Okay, so ab about about fifty percent of workers are on an hourly pay structure. Okay, this shows here what are the total number of people that are paid on an hourly rate. And this is, if you notice here, this is in the thousands. So let's try to make this bigger. Uh, number of workers in the thousands. So eighty two to eighty nine thousand. So eighty two million people. Eighty two point two million people are paid on an hourly wage. And they represent between, depending on what study you read, 51 and 56% of all workers. So there's about 160 million workers in America who are participating in the job force, okay? Of the people, total hourly workers, 82,289,000 of them, who make the minimum wage are either at or below the minimum wage. And let me clarify that for you. Either they're at the minimum wage of 7.25 an hour or... Some states, and, and the federal government allows this, will allow you to pay below the minimum wage. So maybe you only make $5 an hour, but you work in a job where tips are customary and make up the spread. So a lot of waitresses in certain states will make $5 an hour, even though the federal minimum wage is $7.25, but they'll make another, on average, $10 or $12 in reported tips that then takes their wages well above uh, the minimum wage. But of all the hourly workers, all 82 million that are in here, there are 1.9%, 1.9% of hourly workers who make either the minimum wage or below the minimum wage. And even that's a little deceptive because again, the people making below the minimum wage might have total compensation significantly higher than the minimum wage because of the fact that they have tip income, which isn't calculated in here. So uh, Chris, if we take, uh, if we just take 83 million times 1.9%, 83 million times 1.9%. What is that like? Uh, 1.6, 1, 1, 1,650,000 people or so. 1,590,000. 1. 1.1? 1. 
Uh, so take 82,300,000 times 1.9%. Let's just make sure we get the numbers right. 1.9. 1.9%. Yeah, it's going to be right around uh, 1.6 million people or something like that. Yeah, 1,563,700. Okay, so in all of America, there's about a million five, million six people making a minimum wage, um, which, you know, if you're a progressive and you want everybody to make a fair wage, whatever that means to you, or the fight for 15 or a, a minimum living wage, all these terms get thrown around without any actual quantification of what it means to people. Um, you know, that number is tragic, right? 1.6 million people. But if we dig deeper into the data... A lot of those people, so 16 million of them, uh, about a fifth of them, are between 16 and 24 years old. So these are your stereotypical, you know, first job at Taco Bell at $16, you know, at 16 years. Um, first working through college, delivering pizza, and probably getting some tips under the table, and they're making minimum wage, something of that nature. So, you know, the number of people who are making minimum wage... Uh, it says here people that are paid at the hourly wage. Let's go to 25 and older. So if we go everybody 25 and over, there's about 66 million people working on an hourly wage uh, who are over 25 who probably have some more life expect, uh, life life expenses. And about 1.4% of them are working at the minimum wage level. So now we're down to about 700,000 people nationwide who are working at a level of minimum wage. And then this breaks it down more here. Actually, one of the things I was encouraged of, there's almost no discernible difference in race. So white, black, Asian, Hispanic, um, as a percentage of population, the same percentage of the working population versus the actual population, this is about the same percentage is earning around the minimum wage. So there's really no statistical gap there where, you know, Hispanics on average are making minimum wage significantly uh, more often than Caucasians or Asians or whatnot. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and then the other interesting stat here is of the biggest group of people that are making minimum wage, you know, 20 million uh, so there's 20 million part-time workers. They have the highest percentage of people that are paying minimum wage at four and a half percent. That makes sense to me, right? So if you're a part-time worker, maybe you're a seasonal worker, you're picking up a little bit, uh, a few extra shifts at Macy's during the holidays, <clears throat> or you're only working eight to 20 hours a week because you want that part-time job, maybe because you want the benefits or you want something else, or you want to keep your status or whatever the case is, um, you know, I, it's not shocking to me that part-time workers would be at a minimum wage at that starting pay. So there isn't, contrary to what you would probably believe if you watch the news, there isn't these tens of millions of, you know, single moms and working families that are making minimum wage. Now, there might be millions of people that can't make ends meet because of other decisions or where they live or the other cost of goods. But this idea that we have tens of millions of people stuck in dead-end minimum wage jobs... Uh, it's just not true. The data just doesn't doesn't bear that out. And <laughs> I, I really like the comedian Adam Carolla, who's become a little bit more of a social commentator. And he wrote a book. I can't remember what the name of the book was, but it was the one where he talked about uh, Taco Bell. And I don't know if Taco Bell's in the title. Maybe, Chris, you can look this up, the Adam Carolla book about Taco Bell. You know, he talks about when he went for his first job interview when he was 16, he did not get a job at Taco Bell. And it was for a minimum wage job. And what he writes in the book is he writes about, yeah, the reality was I wasn't qualified for that job. At 16 years old, I didn't know that you drag a mop instead of push a mop. Um, what's it's the called name of the book? Not Taco Bell material. Yeah, there you go. Not Taco Bell material. So he talks about in that book how like, he wasn't owed a job. Nobody owed him a job at a living wage. He went to go apply for a minimum wage job at Taco Bell, and he didn't get it because he didn't know how to do anything. He didn't know how to operate the deep fryer. He didn't know that you pull a mop across the floor to get a better cleaning standard on the floor than pushing a mop. All these things that you learn in minimum wage jobs, but there's not this just epidemic of people who are making minimum wage jobs at 40 years old when they have all type of skills and they're just stuck there. Minimum wage jobs were not, minimum wage jobs were never meant to feed a family of four. Minimum wage jobs is the absolute minimum that people have to pay you so you can garner skills and get some work experience so that you can then move up. Um, you know, it, it almost feels, to me it almost feels people crusading crusading for this higher minimum wage 
they, they one, don't get the business economics of running a business, obviously. And two, they just, either because they never worked in a minimum wage job or they're now at a place of, we'll use everybody's favorite buzzword, privilege, uh, you know, being in the Senate and having a great job and tons of staff around them, uh, they, they just, they don't, they don't get it. They don't get that there's a lot of people that aren't worth more than minimum wage. And that doesn't mean they're not, they don't have value as human beings. That doesn't mean that they can't be something so much greater than a minimum wage employee. But when you start a job, you are not worth a whole lot to the company, right? You just don't know what to do. You don't know what buttons to push. You don't know how to drag the mop. You don't know how to operate the deep fryer. And and you have to make minimum wage for X amount of time in order to uh, in, in order to prove that you're worth more money. So I, I feel like a certain cross section of Americans have it backwards. You don't pay somebody more in hopes that they show up and add more value and know more things and create more value, right? You don't go out and pay somebody $100,000 a year hoping that they grow into the job. Same thing at $10 an hour or $15 an hour. What you do is you employ people for the absolute minimum that you can, and then it's their job as the employee to add value and obtain more skills and become more indispensable to the company so that they can demand a higher wage, right? Uh, you know, there's people that have worked for me where if they came in and asked for a pay raise, I would laugh at them. And those people I probably should have fired uh, or fired earlier. And then there's other people that could come in and demand a higher wage. And, and I wouldn't be able to get out my checkbook fast enough um, because they add so much value to the process. Right. And sometimes there's just a lag where it takes a few months or a few years before those skills catch up and then you pay them more and then they obtain more skills and then you pay them more. And there's there's always some lag. Companies aren't in the business of going out there to pay people as much as they possibly can, businesses exist to turn a profit. And that's just the way it is. Um, so I wanted to go over one more stat here. And this is the average wage index. And I think if you're being genuine about the compensation conversation, because of all the reasons that I just told you, minimum wage jobs need to exist. And that's what's going to happen when you make the minimum, when you have the minimum skills. What I think is actually a little bit more interesting is the average and median amounts of net compensation. So when you look at what is the average compensation and what's the median comp uh, uh, compensation? So average is you take everybody's compensation, you divide by all the worker bees. The median compensation is what's the compensation right dead center of the economic curve, meaning 50% of people uh, make below this number and 50% of people make above this number. So I think this is actually a much more interesting stat to go to to say, okay, what is the what is the average net compensation of an employee? And I think even the average gets a little bit messed up because you do have the, uh, we'll just say Jeff Bezos out there who probably makes X amount of dollars a year and that throws off the average. So let's go to the median. So where 50% of the people are making below that number and 50% of the people are making above that number. And you can see that when they started tracking these numbers back in 1991, the average US employee um, or the, the midline of all U.S. employees was about $15,000. So half the people in America made over that, half the people made under that. Probably a surprising number to a lot of people. Uh, and remember, this takes into account part-time workers, minimum wage workers. Uh, these days, it would take into account gig workers, self-employed workers. But if you come down here, you look from 1991 to 2019, the median price point is $34,000, which is 127 127% uh, increase since 91. Now, obviously, 91 was 30 years ago, so you would expect just from inflation this number to be pretty high. But you can see year over year, every year except for 2009, when the market crashed, Americans are getting about a 2 to well, 5% in the 90s, dropped down to 1%. Uh, again, 2009, the economic crash was the only year that this went down. Now we're 3%, 3%, 1%, 3%, 3%, 2%, you know, uh, now 4%. Americans are getting about a 3 to 4% pay raise per year. So if you want to be a little bit more genuine about the conversation, going to what the average income in America is or the median income, um, I think this is a better number to look at. Now, we could definitely argue that if you're a family of four and mom's making 34000 and dad's making 34000 can you live off of $68,000 a year and raise a family? 
In California, probably not. In most areas of California. In many other areas of the country, absolutely. You can own a home. I know because I do home loans. You can own a home and you can have a nice little life carved out for you and your family at, you know, both parents working at 68000 or 69000 a year being this, uh, this median income. So I think this is just such a better number to look at if you're trying to have an honest conversation about wages. And then, uh, yeah, here's just more of the national indexing, same, same stat here that I just pulled up somewhere else, so we don't need to look at that. All right, now, this is, this is a little interesting um, because one thing that I always try to have a conversation with is this idea of, all right, if we've got all these problems, if people can't live off a of minimum wage and they need a living wage, or we need to raise more taxes, or we need people to pay their fair share, pick any political talking point. My question always goes to, okay, well then what's the answer, right? What's the answer? If people aren't paying their fair share, and currently uh, if you take the state of California, kind of just a, a employee who's on a W-2 that doesn't have a ton of deductions or a, a business where they can shelter income or they're not a property investor or they're not living off a trust fund. If you kind of just have a, a normal pay stub W-2 employee in California, especially with the new tax laws that are being proposed by Biden and here in California, those people pay a lot of taxes. If you're on a W-2 in California, you know, you're making over $70,000. You start paying a decent chunk of ta taxes. You make over 200, goodness forbid, you make over $400,000. You know, over about 400000 in California between state, federal, excise taxes, licensing fees, property taxes, um, uh, sales tax, uh, car registration, anything that you can come up with that you're paying the government some form of tax. Between the state of California and the federal government, if you're making... You know, over $100,000, $200,000, definitely if you're making over $400,000, the government's, tr they're finding a way to get 50 cents of every dollar that you earn. And so I always ask people, I'm like, you know, again, normally Democrats and progressives that are like, well, we just need these people to pay their fair share. They need to pay more. I'm like, okay, what is the number? What What is the number that would satisfy you? Is it 50%, 60%, 90%? Like, wh when do we get to a number? And And I can tell you, I have never, and I've asked this question hundreds of times, I've never had somebody come back and be like, well, I think 72.5% on all income over a million dollars is fair. I would disagree, but at least that would be a fair place to jump off and have a conversation. And so a lot of times when people are railing against this minimum wage, which we've already shown that most of those numbers are a fallacy, railing against this minimum wage, you know, the guy at McDonald's can't even raise a family of four on minimum wage. Well, of course, uh, the guy working at McDonald's can't raise a family of four on minimum wage because the minimum wage job was never meant to be a lifetime profession where you make minimum wage, aka the minimum, for the rest of your life while you're trying to better yourself and better your family. Like, you you gain more skills, you gain more time in the profession, you, you learn how to operate the deep fryer so you're not making minimum wage anymore you become an assistant manager then you become a manager and then you become a regional manager and then maybe one day you go to mcdonald's university and you open your own mcdonald's franchise and then you're a millionaire i don't know um but minimum wage was never meant to sustain a family of four so then the talking point usually shifts to well uh maybe it's 15 dollars, maybe it's 20 dollars. Uh, americans should at least be able to make a minimum a, a living wage so this is one of the things again i appreciate going back to this uh, uh, USA Facts, is at the very bottom of their minimum wage stats, they say the minimum wage and the living wage are not the same thing. The minimum wage is established by Congress and enforced by the Department of Labor. This is a real tangible thing that we can talk about. And the living wage is a subjective concept calculated by policymakers and advocacy groups that work backwards to calculate a wage to cover the, ba the basic needs and expenses of individuals in a particular area. In cases where minimum wage is less than the estimated living wage, the suggestion is that earnings from a full-time minimum wage job are not enough to support somebody without additional income or aid, meaning, meaning government aid. And it's like, well, yeah, no shit. Because the minimum wage was never meant to fully support somebody, and it definitely wasn't meant to fully support somebody and their spouse and their family because the minimum wage, the minimum that a company has to pay is the minimum for a reason. So, um, and by the way, I think this is where so many people start talking past each other, and this, this really... This really establishes it right here, right? Because when I'm talking about the minimum wage, I'm talking about what they just said, something established by Congress and, and enforced by the Department of Labor. And then you can go to the Department of Labor and you can look at the actual statistics and you can see what they actually are. Whereas the living wage is kind of just this nebulous concept, right? 
And that's why the answer is always going to be more, 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 more. So when Chuck Schumer says, oh, we should fight for 15 to have a minimum wage federalized nationwide at $15 an hour, Ocasio-Cortez just comes out and says, well, no, it should be $20 an hour because we want people to have a living wage. And then somebody more progressive than her next year will come out and say, well, no, if we really want to take care of the workers of America, workers unite, you know, sounds very Marxist to me, um, we should pay them $25 an hour. And then somebody else will come out and say like, well, if we could just get these greedy corporations to give up a little bit more, why not pay them $30 an hour? And it's so funny because when I'm talking about minimum wage with people, I always go to the extreme anchor and say, hey, why don't we just make minimum wage $100 an hour? No, just tomorrow. Everybody at Walmart makes $100 an hour. And people will quickly see through the 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 rational or they'll they'll see the the rational pathway and they'll and they'll see through this fallacy of the minimum wage. They'll be like, oh well, wait a minute, no, you can't do that, Scott. Because if minimum wage was a hundred dollars, well, then a gallon of milk would be eighty dollars, and jeans would be you know a pair of Levi's would be seven hundred dollars, and we would we would basically defeat the purpose of making <clears throat> a higher minimum wage because all the cost of goods would just be more expensive. I'm like, exactly. Now take off a zero and make the minimum wage $10 instead of 100 and you have the same exact effect, right? So let, let's just parse this out real quick. Um, or let's go, down, let's go down this rabbit hole. By the way, very few people at Walmart at minimum wage or very few people that work at Walmart make a minimum wage. But let's just, let's just vilify Walmart and say that everybody there makes minimum wage. So everybody at Walmart makes minimum wage, which is not a fact, but whatever. Let's just vilify Walmart because everybody loves to pick on Walmart. So all other people make minimum wage and their products are really uh, cost effective. So now the federal government comes up and says, you know what, Walmart, we need everybody to make a living wage. Again, they never bother to define that, but let's just arbitrarily call it the fight for 15 because that's a nice uh, alliteration that rolls off the tongue and it will be picked up by the media and, you know, political parties are basically just marketing firms. So fifth, you know, fight for 15 sounds really good. Let's make overnight everybody at Walmart have a minimum wage of $15. Okay. So now the person that was making seven twenty five an hour is going to make fifteen dollars an hour. The problem is the shift manager who used to make twelve dollars an hour is going to say, "Well, I used to make five dollars more than the minimum wage employees. I don't want to just make fifteen. I want to make twenty. And then the 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 shift manager who used to make seventeen is now going to want to make twenty two. And the brand, you know the store manager who used to make one hundred fifty grand is going to want to make two hundred grand. So it's just this inflation of wages. So then Walmart turns around and says, "Ah, shucks." Well, we had to raise wages. I guess we'll just make less profit. No, that's not going to happen. Walmart still has a profit that they want to make one because that's their target, that's their job, that's their that's the reason a business exists to turn a profit. Two, they have a share they have shareholders to be beholden to. And by the way, bad things happen to, do, to bad things happen to good companies that don't make money, right? So you can you can be a really good company who does all the right things and if you're not turning a profit, you will not be a company any longer. So Walmart's not going to say, "Well, the government made us raise wages. So we're just going to take less profit. No, they're just going to raise the cost of goods. So now milk goes from 485 a gallon to 625 a gallon. And a pair of Levi's goes from $27 to $47 or whatever the case may be. Guess what? I make a pretty good living. I don't give a shit if milk goes from $4 and 80 cents to $6 and 80 cents. But guess who does? The people making minimum wage. So all the minimum wage does is it inflates the cost of labor which then if the business wants to stay in business and turn a profit, increases the cost of goods, and then the only people that suffer are the people that are making minimum wage because I don't really care if milk is a buck or two more expensive. I'm still going to buy the same number of gallons of milk, but people that are only making now $15 an hour in this theoretical fight for 15, they're still going to have to ration themselves and they're still going to have a hard time. So anyway, I digress, soapbox, but let's get back to this living wage. So uh, this is a calculator that MIT did. I think it's really good. Um, uh, it, it shows they've taken kind of all the data, uh, transportation, childcare, food, housing, and they, they break it down by geographical area really, really well. So let's just look at California. What does it take to make a living wage since that's the favorite talking point? Uh, let's go to Los Angeles County, which is where I live. Los Angeles County in Los Angeles. What is a living wage? So if you are one adult, with zero children in order to make a living wage. And what I love about this is they break down typical expenses. So cost of food for one person, cost of medical, cost of housing, uh, transportation, civic, I don't know what that means, uh, other required annual income, and then they, then they uh, 
put in the taxes that you're going to have to pay because everybody has to pay taxes. They come up with the required income. They divide that by, I think there's 2,020 working hours in a 40-hour work week if you work every week of the year, and they come up with $19. So in order to have a living wage, a living wage for a single individual in Los Angeles County, that would be $19 an hour. There is nobody, because it would be political suicide, there is nobody out there on the left or the right advocating for a minimum hourly wage in America at the federal level to be $19 an hour, $19.35. Because they know, remember, these political parties, they don't care. They're just marketing firms. They're just marketing for more votes. And they know if they were to market for a minimum wage of $19.35 an hour, that that would be political suicide. But the sob story that we frequently hear is like, well, you know, somebody working that minimum wage job at McDonald's, they don't even have a living wage to pay for them and their family. So if we go here to two adults working with two children, the living wage jumps up to $28 an hour. So again, looking at the expenses of two children, they, they calculate food, transportation, living, medical, whatnot. A, fa a family of two, two adults with two children, so a family of four, sorry, two adults, two children, family of four, the living wage to live in Los Angeles County is $116,000 a year. So both working parents would have to make $28 an hour, which many people in Southern California do, in order to sustain a family of four, right? Two working adults and two children. Now, obviously in California, there's a ton of people, there's millions of people that don't make a dual income of $116,000 a year. So they either have less kids, they have no kids, takes their living wage down to $66,000 a year, which is about 12 bucks an hour, which is kind of like every entry level job in California is about $12 an hour. So two working adults who say, hey, we're not really in a financial place to have kids yet. They can actually live on $12 an hour here in Southern California, one of the most expensive places to live and they can make it. Now, are they getting ahead? Are they saving for retirement? Are they financially, you know, um, are they financially well off enough to have kids? No, not yet. But these are the adult decisions we have to make, right? I didn't have kids back when I was making $8 an hour uh, in the military or back when I was making four fifty an hour scooping ice cream because I was not financially ready to have children, right? Or if you can't make this wage, there's a lot of families in California that, that, um, you know, double up on housing to cut expenses or they don't have a car or they work close enough to their work where they can walk, right? So this idea of substituting the word minimum wage with living wage, it's a misnomer in, in so many ways. It's so intellectually disingenuous because one, it, 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 it over quantifies the number of people that are working in minimum wage jobs, which we just showed you, that's bullshit. Two, it never really establishes the self-reliance that people need to have, or it never really discusses the self-reliance that people need to have to obtain more skills, work harder, learn more, make themselves more valuable to the company, you know, add more value to the company so they can make more money. And then even if we wanted to make it a living wage, you can just look at these charts and see that we're never going to get there. You're never going to get to a living wage on minimum wage, it's just never going to happen because it's not financially viable, right? If the lowest paid people among us, AKA the people working at Taco Bell or in food services or delivering our pizza, if they were making $15 an hour, $19 an hour, guess what? It then throws this whole calculus off, the typical expenses. Now food gets more expensive, transportation gets more expensive, everything gets more expensive. And then guess what? There's gonna be more social safety nets because more people are, uh, less people are employed, more people are on employment, means taxes are gonna go up. So it's just this vicious cycle of the government trying to help or more accurately, trying to win votes through marketing ploys and through taxation and redistribution of income, and it never really solves the problem, right? Plug in this calculator. Look at how just moronic the talking points actually are. And that's my thought on that. Mm -hmm.